Or we're going to call the meeting to order. The first uh, agenda item is public comment. The chair requests that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before the Board of Directors. Please note that the public will have the opportunity to speak on specific items on the Metro Vision plan between the staff presentation and the committee discussion. Is there anybody here that would like to discuss, uh, like to address the board? Seeing nobody. Item three, summary of May 6 meeting. Were there any changes, additions, deletions to the minutes of May 6, 2015? Seeing none, they'll be accepted as is. On the agenda, we have a couple of changes that we're going to make, and I also um, have a couple of comments to kind of, kind of frame our discussion. First of all, the informational item, item number six, is going to be moved ahead of the action items. This is an, is an item that we missed last meeting, and I fear if it is at the end of the meeting, we will miss it again. So informational item number six is going to be moved to the head of the class and we are going to try to limit that to a 10-minute presentation. So then uh, item number four, the uh, tip waiting list, Steve Cook. I'm sorry, excuse me. I moved it and then I forgot what I was doing. Yes, item six, Jacob Rigger. So thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, members of MVIC. I did miss you last month, so I'm very glad to get moved up to the front. Um, I'll try and stay within my 10 minutes because we've got a full agenda today. Uh, but I appreciate the accommodation so that we can introduce this item. Uh, so this is the transportation chapter, the transportation element of uh, the draft MetroVision plan. We call it a connected multimodal region. Um, I should say, by the way, Jacob Rieger or Dr. Cogstaff, uh, I'm in charge of our long-range transportation planning. You know, we often think about transportation as kind of short-range or project-based, um, but we have a robust long-range transportation program, and this element, you know, really does part of that work of taking that long-range look uh, into the future on transportation. So we'll have that perspective as we talk through it uh, here today. Um, once I uh, have my 10 minutes and get through this element, you will have seen uh, four of the five uh, draft elements of MetroVision. Uh, at a future meeting, you will see the uh, environment-based uh, element. So we're, we are getting there. So let's start with guiding framework. You know, let's talk about where we were, um, the draft of where we are now, and how, how we got here. Um, so looking back to MetroVision 2035, we had goals and policies. And then in our MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan, we had action strategies supporting those goals and policies. So that's, that's our existing adopted 2035 plans. Um, now in our new MetroVision plan, we have our overarching foundational measures and targets, which I thought I would say that you discussed today, but you will be discussing them uh, shortly in, in subsequent agenda item. And then for each of the MetroVision elements, kind of our, our framework that you've heard from Brad and, and other staff over the last several months, our outcomes, objectives, and strategies. And those are supported by illustrative local and regional actions and performance measures. So that's kind of the draft of where we are now. So specific to the transportation element, the connected region element that I'll be talking about today, you know, what are kind of the differences? How did we get from 2035 to our draft? Uh, we did several specific things. We restructured the 2035 transportation goals, policies, and action strategies to the new MetroVision framework in the lower left. We updated the transportation topical section, so we wanted to refresh kind of the content of the element itself. Uh, make sure we've got a great 21st century transportation element. Uh, 
and we inserted many performance measures and I'll talk about those as we go through. Most of those performance measures aren't actually new. We've had performance measures. We continue to have performance measures in our Metrovision regional transportation plan, in our specialized plans, our bike ped plan, um, other plans that we do, but they are new in the sense of being collected together in this draft document. So that's, that's kind of a new uh, sort of where the information is housed. We've done all of this with uh, your input, board input, um, especially our committees, our TAC, our Metrovision Planning Advisory Committee, uh, and other input along the way, as, as Brad and Jennifer have discussed in other, um, other conversations about Metrovision. So as we kind of dive into the element, just a reminder uh, on some of the key terms that you've been hearing from staff, outcome, objective, strategy, and performance measures. So outcome, the aspiration that the region would collectively work towards. Uh, the objective, the direction or path to help us achieve the desired outcome as a region. Uh, strategies are methods to accomplish those objectives. So we're getting more specific the farther down we go. And then performance measures are uh, generally quantitative, sometimes qualitative ways to track progress towards those objectives over time. So that's the framework that you've seen in other, other elements and on the whole of Metrovision. Uh, we'll be talking about how that applies to the transportation element. Um, so in that element, we have three draft outcomes. They're numbered sequentially in the Metrovision plan, so instead of one, two, three, um, they're five, six, and seven. Uh, so outcome five, a well-connected regional multimodal transportation system. So let's have a great system. Let's build a great system. Um, a safe, dependable, and efficiently operated transportation system. So as we continue to build the system, let's, you know, let's maintain and efficiently opera operate and optimize uh, that system to get the best out of it that we can. And if we do those things, then hopefully we get to outcome seven, which is a transportation system that contributes to a better quality of life in this region. Um, along with those outcomes, um, kind of through you know, the board and committee process, uh, public process of the input, you know, not quite rising to the level of objective, but a couple of important things that, you know, we heard over and over to stress in this element, you know, the emphasis on insufficient funding, transportation funding, and that's top of mind, you know, for all of us, all of you in your local jurisdictions and us regionally, um, as well as the role of the multimodal system. You know, how do the pieces contribute to make an integrated whole? Um, and I hope you'll see that as we go through the uh, framework of the element. So as we look at these outcome topics, you know, sort of like a website where you kind of have the, the tree that says, you know, how is this website structured? What's the sort of, you know, meta structure of the website? You know, with my 10 minutes, I just want to give you a snapshot of what are the topics that are associated with uh, that you'll find in the content of the transportation element organized by outcome. So for example, again, our first outcome, hey, build a great system, right? So what does that mean? Uh, that means multimodal roadways. We want to have a multimodal system. Uh, roadways are kind of the foundation of that. Um, and then we drill down into the specific modes, transit, transit-oriented development, uh, bicycle, pedestrian, uh, and then how do we connect all those things together both within the region, beyond the region, and our freight movement as well. So that's kind of, you know, building that system, those are the major topics that you'll find. Um, operating and maintaining that system, obviously we're looking at maintenance. Uh, we're looking at operating and managing the system, ITS, uh, variable message signs, you know, apps, you name it. Uh, managing that system, optimizing the system to, you know, get, get the best out of it that we can. Uh, we're also looking at transportation safety and security as well. Safety, you know, safety for all users of the system. And then finally, kind of add in that third objective, you know, if you do those things, having a great, uh, great transportation system that contributes to a better quality of life. Here we're looking at things like transit supportive land use, making that linkage, that integration between transportation development and land use. Uh, travel for mobility impaired, those, you know, those who need uh, travel assistance, uh, human service, specialized uh, transit services, our older adults, our rapidly expanding older adult population. Uh, we're looking at air quality, we're looking at the environment and energy efficiency, and we're looking at TDM, our travel demand management uh, efforts to support that multimodal system. So having said all that, that was sort of drinking from the fire hydrant of everything, and not, every, not everything that's in the element, but the major highlights of what's in the element. Let's go through an example. You know, let's drill down a little bit. So our first outcome, a well-connected regional multimodal transportation system. There are four objectives supporting that outcome. 
So one objective, and, and if you're following along in the document, these are numbered the way they're numbered in the, in the document. So objective 5.1, providing a multimodal roadway system that enables people's, people, excuse me, people's goods and services to travel safely and reliably through our region. Uh, expanding transit facilities and services to all people. Um, here we mean, um, you know, sort of that spectrum, that range of transit services, whether we're talking about fast tracks, other rapid transit, having a good local bus system, um, again, uh, sort of transit dependent or human service, specialized transit, you know, whatever it is, that having, having that comprehensive transit system. Uh, providing a robust bicycle and pedestrian accessibility throughout the region. And then providing, uh, and you've heard me say this, efficient interconnections of that system, connecting these things together uh, within our region and beyond our region. All right, so we've gone, through, we've gone through the four objectives for one outcome. Let's take one of those objectives and drill down a little bit further. So let's take that transit one. And uh, in the element for that particular transit objective, expanding transit facilities and services, there are six strategies to support that objective. So here we're talking about completing fast tracks, obviously, developing and maintaining an expanded metropolitan rapid transit system. So fast tracks, bus rapid transit, you know, maybe someday inner city rail, all of those things together, developing that integrated system, maintaining that system. Um, and you've heard me say providing a comprehensive bus system, demand response for targeted needs. Um, and then here's, you know, even though we're looking at a particular mode, transit, you know, one of the themes throughout this element and throughout the draft plan is integration of things. So even in transit, for example, we talk about integrating bicycle and pedestrian elements with transit. So for example, we might be talking about first and last mile uh, connections to and from the transit service. And then finally, adding transit service in the future where it's needed. And then, you know, so now we've drilled down to we've had the outcome, we've had the objective, we have these strategies supporting this particular objective, and then we have illustrative, supportive uh, regional and local actions uh, to support, you know, these strategies. And, and those are shown in the document, but those could be things like, you know, working with RTD or doing local transit plans, you know, things that, things that are suggestions, but things that help kind of support and implement these strategies. So I mentioned performance measures. The transportation element has approximately 40 performance measures out of uh, 75, you know, approximately 75 in the entire plan. So transportation, obviously, from my perspective, is the most important element of the plan. Um, <laughs> some performance measures uh, are identified as foundational measures with targets. You've been talking about those. You will continue that conversation today. Uh, the element-specific performance measures are grouped by objectives, so that's kind of how they're organized. As you look through the element, um, you can see those performance measures grouped by objective. Many measures are cross-cutting with other MetroVision plan elements. So again, it's that idea of integration across, across elements in this case, across modes, across topics. So that means two things in this case. Some measures are shared among elements. So there are things like uh, fatalities that are in the transportation element, uh, but they're also, I believe, in the health element. Um, so you'll, you'll see some of that. And there's also a few measures that are transportation related that are in other elements. So here we're kind of walking the balance between having, you know, drawing those connections and that integration between different elements of the plan, but also recognizing that a transportation planner picking up the draft Metro Vision plan obviously wants to see what's in the transportation element. So they're both integrated, but, you know, a little bit sort of standing on their own um, by topic area. So kind of a summary of, of the drink from the fire hydrant that I've given you hopefully within 10 minutes. Multimodal connected transportation system is kind of the focus of the draft element. A plethora of performance measures, again, most of them not new, uh, but new to the document of being collected in one place. Uh, content informed by MetroVision 2035, our 2035 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan, as well as guidance from you all, from the board, from our committees. And I talked about integration uh, between the transportation element integrated with other MetroVision plan elements. So I know that was a lot, um, but uh, be glad to take any questions. You will see this again at a subsequent meeting. So this is kind of that first reading introduction, not an action item today, but would welcome your input at a subsequent meeting. Um, you'll kind of hear some of this again. Uh, and at that time, it'll be more of a you know, recommendation to the board. So with that, thank you, Mr. Chair. Questions, uh, Commissioner Jones. Um, not a question, but a comment. And I don't know if this is where you want any feedback. I think it's um, well done, and I appreciate um, 
all the work that's been put into it. One thing that I would love to see highlighted more specifically is the development of a region-wide bus rapid transit vision as sort of the next post fast tracks piece of our um, collective vision. We talk a lot around this table about how some communities don't have transit and they don't have the density to support transit and there we have haves and have nots when it comes to fast tracks. What do we do about this? Bus rapid transit has the potential to connect the fast track spokes and to bring transit to communities that, that are, are currently without that and don't have the density to support it. And we, we've invested some dollars in it. I think it would be useful to be explicit about that. I know we, you talk about rapid transit, you talk about buses, but to, to really specifically call that out as sort of the vision that we're headed towards, I think would be helpful. So that's a good point. Let me ask a question. That actually is one of the specific uh, regional actions that are mentioned kind of in this transit section. Um, it actually says that specifically. Um, are you asking for an elevation of that more towards like a strategy? Okay. So I saw two hands over here. Mayor Cernanek. Okay. Mayor Cernanek first. Yes. I, thanks for the presentation and, and it works. Just as we're looking at this section as well as other sections, um, and I'm not sure whether it ends up being supplemental or otherwise, um, the some of our discussion either here or and at the, the board level is um, what kind of implications does this have and how many of these or which one of these are really close to uh, more of the mission of Dr. Cog uh, and whatever hat we may happen to be wearing within Dr. Cog uh, around some of that and it would be uh, I think good when you come back to um, maybe have that as a supplemental document recognizing that the plan itself is for the region um, but it may be what are some of the implications for Dr. Cox so that we can understand and have that distinction. Thanks. Mayor Horn. Um, so I'd like to thank you Jacob because that might be the most concise and clear explanation of our vision of a of an integrated transportation system that I've heard my entire time on the board. Um, and I think that's great. I think we've long needed that. Um, my disconnect, and this is just a suggestion for the future, is I think this is great. When I try to tie TIP projects and TIP points to this vision, I get a huge disconnect. That I, and it may just be that I don't understand the tip points well enough. So at some future session, whether it's a board meeting or a training session, or um, our sort of post review of how the tip redesign worked and, and what we might be looking at moving forward, that's the piece I would like to see. If I get points for something in tip, it needs to tie to something in this um, vision from my perspective. Commissioner Rozier. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Jacob, uh, I'll just reiterate every, uh, everybody's comments here. Uh, well done, uh, very um, succinct to the point, good information. Uh, to tie on to what uh, Commissioner Jones mentioned, if you look at the slide under outcome, outcome topics, it's outcome number five, build a great transportation system. And under, you know, on the, no, nope, you were there. There you go. It, it mentions transit, but it only has TOD. And for us in the counties, we we have more outside of TOD than we have in TOD. So for for me, I, I struggle because we want to build a great transportation system to provide that transit opportunity for everyone, not just those. And I was just curious on why you just why it's ident TOD was identified, and not other forms of development. Um, well, good point. Um, short answer is simply to try and be as concise as possible on this particular slide. Um, but as we went through the process, and let me get to it here, you know, particularly on this drilling down of, of, of the transit objective, you know, one of the things we heard is sort of flexibility, you know, being opportunistic, um, and that's why we've tried to cover sort of the range or the suite of uh, transit components. Uh, you know, both rapid transit, but also, you know, good, good local bus system, 
Um, there's language uh, specifically in, el in the element that talks about when and where future transit service is needed, you know, to be op opportunistic and being able to do that, you know, as local conditions warrant. So, you know, one size fits all is hard, but we are trying to be comprehensive in the sense of recognizing that transit means different things to uh, different parts of the region and to have a plan that's encompassing enough to provide that support for folks who you know, need to tailor the transit situation specific to their circumstances. So for example, we even heard from folks, um, I don't want to pick on a county, but one of the outlying counties who said, you know, we don't have a lot of transit service right now, but we want support in the plan to be able to extend, you know, local bus service or a call and ride, you know, or even demand response service when and where it's, it's warranted. And so we tried to have language in the plan to address the issue you're raising. Mayor Pro Tem Elise. I mean, excuse me, <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem Malay. <laughs> he combined us. Um, I, and this may be a follow-up, but the other piece of this that I think is really critical is kind of those last mile connections. And in order to get this expanded service, whether it's for bus rapid transit or for fast tracks, we need something more than just p bike and ped to get those connections. And I really do think that this organization is the appropriate one to kind of take that under uh, our uh, wings and really try and come up with much more creative solutions than we've had so far about whether they're shuttle services that are just much smaller scale. I think we need to work with our partners, but I really feel those last mile connections should really be part of, on both sides, be part of the strategies. Is, is that the zip line from Cabela's to Schwab? Hey, exactly, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. No, it's from Cabela's to the mall. We want to keep it all in the retail tax area. No, no, but, but I do, I, you know, look, Lone Tree is doing our own shuttle, but I think those are the type of solutions that communities are going to need to actually drive, you know, people to the, tra to the, hot, you know, the transit, so. Councilmember Batille. So I guess if zip lines count as transit, Fast <laughs> Rock is good. <laughs> but that is, that's a concern that I would have. I mean, uh, I appreciate Mayor Horn talking about wanting to see how these elements would be tied to TIP, but then it will be very important for me to see where the connection is on, on what is that strategy to expand to communities like my own that do not have transit, particularly if we are tying it straight into the TIP. Because if, if we don't have that connection, guys, then you're basically telling the 60,000 people at Castle Rock, sorry guys, nothing for you. So, I mean, uh, again, in the spirit of being inclusive as a region, I, I would very much like to see how those strategies connect. How are we expand, how are we looking, what strategies are we looking to take to expand service to regions that are not currently covered, while at the same time, yeah, if we're gonna tie them into TIP, how are those going to work together? Councilmember Quinn, did you have your hand up? You did, oh, thank you. Yes, I did. Thank you, and, and all excellent points. There's one word that I always like to see associated with transit because it's so important, and that's convenient. People only will take transit if it's convenient for them to take it, unless, you know, you're somebody like me, I'm gonna go way out of my way to take it. But I just, and that word might already be integrated into the plan, but I think that's something important in terms of actually getting people to use transit. So that's my only comment. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Thank you very much, Chief. Thank you for the input. I appreciate it. All right. Action items. Action item number four, attachment B, Steve Cook. All right. Thank you. Close that out. So as mentioned, this is attachment B. And now that the Dr. Cog Transportation Improvement Program has been adopted, and we funded $260 million worth of Dr. Cog funded things all across the region, um, there's one final step, uh, and that's to define a waiting list of unfunded projects uh, in rank order that can possibly be added to the TIP in the future if, and a big if, if additional funds happen to become available in the next couple of years. Um, we received uh, applications for this current TIP, uh, about $500 million worth of projects. Um, about $300 million of that was not funded, uh, adding up to I think there's about 80 or so projects um, that are 
in essence, eligible um, for this waiting list. Uh, I want to point out the waiting lists have proven uh, useful in the past. So as either additional money comes in or money is freed up because there's sometimes that there's cost savings or sometimes that um, projects aren't completed and they give the money back. Um, they've been very useful um, because when those funds become available, uh, the board has been able to choose projects right down that ranked waiting list uh, without having to create a brand new selection process, brand new scoring, brand new points and all that. So. Um, it has worked in the past. Uh, staff suggests that uh, we work with the TAC, the Transportation Advisory Committee, to uh, develop the um, methods for defining the ranked waiting list of projects and different attributes to consider, um, and then defining uh, a recommended uh, waiting <laughs> list of projects, bring that back to the TAC. Uh, and I also want to point out that part of that is defining the protocols for how and when to select projects from the list, you know, as if if dollars become available, you know, if you just get a few pennies in from the couch cushions, uh, is that enough to you know move down the list, or do you wait till you get a certain amount? Um, how far into the tip? So if it's three and a half years from now, when we're almost ready to do our new tip, you know, should we just carry those dollars over if some become available? So they'll also define some of those uh, types of protocols. Um, so with that, I'll uh, ask if there's any questions and for direction um, for if we should work with the TAC on this and then have them recommend something to bring back to you. Councilmember Kniech. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think it's a great suggestion and I support it. The one question I had, though, is just so we're kind of on the same page. You described it as being helpful in the past, and so I joined the board right after the last tip cycle and went through a couple of these, and I don't remember us using said waiting list. Right. I remember a much different process. Because we had... <laughs> so I was just curious the history yeah. of when that... And that's a really good point, <laughs> because for the first time in history, and I have a long history here, you arrived, I think, right after we had gotten a big chunk of extra money and we used up the waiting list we went down the entire thing okay and i remember you know mr rudy's comment when the waiting list was invent was created for for the for either the last tip or the previous one is we'll never get this much money extra and sure enough we got it in and i think was was when so you that, came and we ran out of money just we, to clarify was, yeah. was so you went down the waiting list and yep. then the new process was used right okay. because even more money came in okay. mm -hmm. I Mayor think this Horton. is a practical suggestion. Um, so I guess my my suggestion would be that there has to be a process. I mean, I, I love the idea of the waiting list, but there has to be a process to update it because the value of the waiting list deteriorates every day further away from the original submissions that we get. So the waiting list might be really valuable if we have money this year. Three years from now, other projects may have emerged that are more valuable, and that, I think, to Robin's point, was the conundrum that we had the last time around. We didn't have any good process to integrate those new projects that had surfaced and, and might really warrant being fairly high on the waiting list. So that would be my suggestion. Whoever takes it, I think TAC is, is fine for the recommendations. And they and if it's moved on to the tech, they would clearly identify all of those protocols and steps, and in addition to just the list for you to look at. Other questions or comments, Commissioner uh, Jones? Just gonna see if we're ready for a motion. Yes. So I move that uh, we adopt the tech recommendation as done with the tech and develop the waiting list and procedures for our members. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Steve. All right. Attachment C, action item number five. Um, you know, I have some I have some frame framing that I'm gonna do, but actually I'm gonna let Brad go first and then we'll talk about how we're going to frame this a little bit. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we're back again to talk about uh, measures in the uh, Metro Vision Plan, uh, specifically the proposed foundational measures. Um, I will tell. Do you do you have a copy of this presentation for us? It's in the packet. Is it, oh, okay, good. There's nothing different on the screen than this. Correct. Be in the packet. Okay, thank you. Um, so this uh, this is the continuation of a conversation that really has been going on since at minimum March. Um, maybe even some time uh, before that. Um, a lot of what, it, what is in the presentation um, as well as in the memo uh, is not new information. It's stuff that you've seen before, so I'm going to go pretty quickly in the presentation. I'm really going to hit some highlights. Um, most of the new stuff in the presentation are really staff responses to questions that came up from the committee um, last month. So a quick idea of kind of what the run-through is going to look like. Um, obviously, I'm going to do a little bit of presenting to you. Um, as a reminder, we did this for the first time last month. We actually now have an opportunity for the public to comment after staff presentation and before um, this uh, committee takes action on anything related to, to the MetroVision, to an action item relate, related to the MetroVision plan. So I just wanted to remind you of that little piece. And then, as the chair mentioned, um, there is obviously time for deliberation and action, with most of the focus today on four foundational measures, um, one, three, uh, four and five, and I'll do a status check on everything else um, here here in a second. Um, before sort of um, dialing in real quick, real quickly, I wanted to kind of give you a little bit of context, and I think in some ways I can build off um, Jacob's presentation because I think he did a good job with this. Um, I just want this group to understand that for the in the current draft of MetroVision and for every version of MetroVision that has ever existed, there have been these sort of six core principles about what this plan is and what and really what it values and how it plans to be operationalized. And for this conversation, I really think um, two are germane. Um, for your full conversation, I think all six are obviously something that you should be thinking about. Uh, but for in this sort of talk, this conversation about measurement, I mean, continue to understand that the plan is aspirational, long range, and regional in focus. These are all regional uh, measures that we're talking about. And the other thing that really I, I want to emphasize is, is that we always talk about this, that this is MetroVision is a plan, but more importantly, MetroVision is an ongoing dialogue and conversation. Um, we have two opportunities each and every year for the plan to be amended, and really with this performance-based um, approach that we're taking, that suggests that with some regularity, MVIC and the board are going to see the results of those measures, and it may suggest that we need new outcomes, new strategies, new measures themselves. So you will constantly be seeing information that may suggest uh, the plan needs to be uh, amended in some way. This is sort of a, a very a shorthand version of, of, of something that Jacob uh, presented in, in his slides. I mean, obviously, we kind of have been focused here um, on the measures piece, but I think it's just important to kind of understand sort of the full spectrum of things that are really going on within within the draft plan. The centerpiece centerpiece of the plan is really 16 outcomes that have been drafted that sort of in in, uh, in aggregate sort of talk about what this sort of shared uh, vision uh, for the future of of this region um, will be, and really that's then. Uh, sort of supported and bolstered by a series of strategies and actions of how we're going to get there. Um, there's been a sort of a series of questions around this table about how do we move the needle. Um, that's really what those strategies and actions are about. I mean, there are, if not dozens, potentially hundreds of strategies and actions in the plan that really are those things, how we actually can, can make progress um, towards those desired outcomes. And the measures are just simply, are we, are we making the progress that we hope to make? So a little bit about where we left off. So if you remember, we did a series of kind of straw polling um, last time to see how people were um, in terms of support for both a measure um, and a target. Um, these were the ones, except for number two, were, were the ones that we're going to circle back and talk about today because, frankly, they were all split pretty even 50-50 with some folks, about half of, the, half of the folks that responded saying, yes, I support uh, the measure and the target, and half saying, well, not so much, let's talk about it. Uh, the one exception uh, being foundational measure two, housing density within the UGB, it sort of fell on that more than 70 percent of the folks around the table supported both the measure um, and target as, as proposed. And these were the seven or so that, that, that really this group felt were probably in good shape to at least have a decision point, right? Um, the, all of these received um, in that straw polling at least 70% support, with the lone exception being the greenhouse gas emissions, which really kind of came, came in at 65%. And you guys spent some time talking about, is 60% is the right target, or should we go to something more like 70%? And with a hand vote, you said, we actually maybe let, let's just stay where, let's um, leave it as it is um, with the 60% target. So in some ways, these seven, I think you've all gotten to the point where you're ready to make a decision on these. So here's the four that we're going to cover uh, very quickly today. So again, lots 
um, um, in your memo, and I'm going to cover this very quickly since, since a lot of this is not necessarily um, all that new. Uh, so urban centers, um, this is a carryover goal for Metro Vision 2035. Um, the key note that we've been wanting to make with you is really it's just a, it's a change of approach of how we calculate the measure itself. And we've actually talked about this with Invic, the difficulty of tracking a new job and where a new job locates versus all jobs, right? So really this is transitioned to the share of jobs and, and, and housing within um, urban centers uh, within our region. In terms of the trend stuff, I think the two key points to keep in mind, the trend includes the recession. Um, how that would skew the results, I have no idea. It could, it could go one way or the other or maybe have no real impact um, whatsoever. And the other thing to keep in mind in terms of that future projection, it assumes no new urban centers. It assumes the 104 urban centers that we have today, which is not, not likely. Uh, we expect urban centers can continually be revised, oftentimes expanded. And as I, I can't remember if it's mentioned in, in this memo or previous memo, we have uh, 39 transit stations on the fast track system that currently aren't touched by an urban center, right? So over the course of time, local communities may decide, decide this is a place that we really do want to concentrate population and employment growth, therefore expanding kind of the coverage of urban centers around the region. So this is just a reminder of, of, of that change of how the sort of the method for calculating this, going from 50% of new housing and 75% of new employment to the actual share. If you, if you actually sort of play out sort of the, the trend according to the 24, 2040 projections, we end up at 22% um, of housing in urban centers and 48% um, of employment in urban centers. So housing plus transportation costs. Um, obviously, this group has spent a lot of time on this. Uh, in April, you recommended that the that, that TAC take this up. And so they did, and so really the proposal that you're seeing in front of you is, is a recommendation from TAC. And I, I explained last month kind of the, the tweak that, that TAC made, made in terms of how we uh, think about this measure and, and, and staff is supportive of, this, of that tweak. We thought it was actually a really good way to respond to what we were hearing um, from, from MVIC. Uh, one thing that did come up last month was that the measure is written, felt really wordy and kind of hard to digest, and so we've come up with a, a simplified way to, to think about this. Um, this appears on the screen, but it's also in the memo. It really kind of just drops the whole part about the sort of 45% of, of, of income, because I think that's kind of a known commodity, or it could be shown as a, as a citation or something. It just really gets to the, to the, to the basics um, here of what this measure is ultimately trying to, to show. The other thing that this, this group charged us with is to do our best to try to um, walk you through a little bit how the actual metal, the, the model works in terms of calculating these things. There's this figure appears uh, in the memo and some, some people are visual learners, some people can read it and get it, so I just wanted to sort of quickly kind of walk you through it. In essence, and this is just about transportation cost. Housing costs are very simple. That's observed data from the Census Bureau. There is no issue there. We just simply grab it from the Census Bureau. The modeling is really around the idea of transportation costs, and it really comes down to three things. The cost, the cost associated with owning a vehicle or multiple vehicles, the cost of using that vehicle, and then the cost associated with using transit. It, it's, it's really um, as simple as that. So just walking you through this um, a little bit, um, you know, we talked about this issue of, of local versus national data, and as we've talked, you know, staff in general has become more comfortable with this, particularly as, we's, as we've talked with the developers um, of, of this tool. And really, so there's a lot of local data that comes into to understanding. Um, it uses this sort of box over to here to kind of create predictive variables. Based on all of these characteristics, what is the likelihood that a household is going to own an automobile, how often are they going to use it, and how often are they going to use transit? Um, one of the things that we struggled with early on as staff was this model had evolved a lot over the past decade or so, and we weren't sure if we were in the middle of an evolutionary change of this model or if we were at this sort of end. And that's one of the things that we talked about with the developers, and, and in their minds, um, they're at the point where this, in their minds this, this model is now mature, and the only, the only things that would happen in the future would be very, very minor tweaks. Um, they are very happy with sort of the predictive um, uh, rates that they're getting out of this. The one that I think they struggled with the most over the last five or so years um, is the auto use, but in the last up update they've gotten to where they're actually really comfortable with the predictive capability of the model when it comes to predicting how often people are going to, to drive. The one thing that we did talk about previously that again was sort of a staff concern that I think we feel much better about today than we did even three months ago 
with this idea of how national costs were going to was going to influence the results um, of this measure. Um, the thing that we've now kind of come to understand in the process is that yes, it uses national cost um, associated with this consumer expenditure survey, which has to be done nationally because the cost of doing it for each individual region would be um, astronomical. But those national costs are then scaled to local conditions, particularly income, right? So the easiest way to think about it is, you know, when it comes to auto owning, you know, the cost of owning a car, it scales it down to a person living in a, in a block group that has a median income of $35,000 for household income, it's not going to own the same kind of car of a block group that has a median household income of $100,000 a year. They're just simply going to have different auto ownership costs and they're going to, they're going to have different maintenance costs. The costs are simply going to be different. So we've, we've gotten to the, to the fact that we're comfortable that it really does ultimately kind of give us a local set of, of data that, that we can have a higher level um, of confidence in. Uh, in terms of the transit side, the transit cost, again, it uses a national data source, but that na national data source is ultimately populated by, by local data. So uh, RTD and other transit providers um, around the country share their information related to, to fares and, and revenues that, that ultimately then informs the transit costs associated with, with households that are choosing to use transit um, in our region. So I know, I know that's a lot quickly, but, um, and then the other thing that, on this particular measure, and there's a little bit of the, on this in the memo, and then we cover a little bit of the sort of move the needle issues later as well. Um, you know, how do we as a region kind of move the needle um, on this issue? And we kind of covered this quick, uh, briefly before, and I'll just, again, I'll hit it real quickly. You know, one thing in terms of the sort of the variable cost, in terms of how much you drive, how much fuel you use, what the, what the maintenance costs are, that really ultimately can be linked back to VMT. Uh, vehicle miles traveled, which is obviously something that this organization has, has really paid attention to for, for quite some time. Um, shorter trips, less trips means you use less fuel and you have less maintenance costs. So that's the way that that can, can come down. Um, on the sort of fixed cost side of things, it really is about opportunities for people to have one less car than they may have needed otherwise. Right, the opportunity for a household to go from three cars to two cars, or two cars to one car, or one car to zero, that's the thing that really allows people to lower um, that fixed cost associated with, with simply owning a vehicle, which can be a very high percentage of that, that overall um, calculation. So moving on to foundational measure four, um, cost burdened households. Um, this is one that has uh, been proposed uh, for this group to consider um, since the beginning, but it has changed um, since the sort of the, our first conversation, um, largely based on um, comments from, from INVIC, and I'll just I'll quickly remind you of what those changes were. When originally proposed, this measure was oriented around all households, regardless of income, what percentage of households in this region are cost burdened, which means paying more than 30% of their household income towards um, housing costs. Uh, it was suggested by, by members of this group that really we're not necessarily interested in all households. We're interested in certain income categories um, and, and their, house, their housing expenditures and how it ultimately impacts uh, their, their ability to, to make those, um, those costs work. And so staff has come back with a recommendation of, of focusing on households earning less than $50,000 per year. Um, and we have also previously, uh, and I, I think there's some in the memo as well, the two kind of logical breakpoints based on the data that we have to work with are $50,000 a year and $75,000 a year. We're, we, we are coming with a recommendation of 50, but we've also given you most of the information related to the $75,000 threshold if that, if that feels um, like it might be something that you're more comfortable with. 75% um, of all housing cost burdened um, households earn less than uh, $50,000 a year. And if you bump that up to 75,000, 90% of all the, the cost burden households in this region earn $75,000 a year or less. So it really does cover kind of a pretty f uh, full range of folks that really would be impacted um, and accounted for uh, in this measure. Uh, so this was another one that uh, this group sort of talked about, kind of the move the needle um, conversation. And I really kind of just wanted to point right back to, as I suggested, really MetroVision lays that out. Um, the draft plan in its whole really talks about strategies and actions that can address um, many, many of these issues. And so uh, this slide really kind of lays out the example 
uh, actions that were that were formulated by the ad hoc committee uh, that focused on integrating uh, the issue of housing um, into MetroVision should uh, the board choose to go in that direction. So from a regional perspective, maybe it's maybe it's a convening role to get people to together to really focus um, on this issue, and then you can see potential local actions as well. Maybe it's reviewing local plans and ordinances to make sure that they can ultimately deliver housing product that is affordable um, to as many people as possible, uh, those sorts of things. Um, last one, uh, the health facilities. There's really nothing new here that you haven't seen before. Um, I will just sort of um, remind you, this is something that probably was mentioned a few months back. Um, this really comes from something that we heard from the board workshop back in 2013. Um, if you were there and kind of went through that conversation, and there are probably lots of people around the table that were not, one of the things that we asked at that time was, tell us really what you're experiencing in your local community that in your minds is, is regional in nature and maybe is something that MetroVision ought to figure out um, if there's a regional perspective here that ought to be brought to the issue. And one of the things, there were kind of nine things that bubbled to the top, and one of them was this issue of access to health care. Um, and so that's really kind of where the genesis of this measure was to sort of respond to that and to give you um, that option as something, is, is this something that as a region we want to track uh, going forward. This kind of just gives you an idea of those places that we're looking at. So this is urban centers, high capacity uh, transit uh, corridors, including bus stops, and then rural town centers. What we're really just trying to understand is, are this region's health facilities located in these places that really have a high degree of access and are places that are, that are actively trying to um, add population and employment uh, going forward? With that, that concludes my presentation, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. All right, we do have a period of public comment. Um, what I would ask is if you want to address the board, approach the podium and give your name and who you're representing, you will have three minutes for your comments. Is there anybody that wishes to address the board? Seeing nobody? All right, so I wanted, as I mentioned earlier, to kind of um, frame this a little bit and give a little bit of guidelines on the approach with with what we're going to do in the discussion. First of all, I've mentioned this in the last couple of meetings. I will mention it again tonight. We have a hard stop at 6 o'clock. So we will be stopping at 6 o'clock. And uh, any open items, we have already identified that a number of the items have been um, gotten to the point where there is a recommendation to the full board from the MVIC committee. We have four items that are open for discussion still. At the six o'clock hard stop, wherever those items are, whether they're resolved or not, if, if let me rephrase that, if they're not resolved with the consensus of this group, they will move forward to the full board with no recommendation. So this will be the last meeting that we're, that MVIC is taking up these issues and uh, at the hard stop at 6 o'clock, anything that's not resolved will move forward without recommendation. I wanted to point out that there are a few options. I'm not suggesting that anybody take these. I'm just putting them out on the table that there are things that we can consider as we deliberate. We can consider that we talk about just the measurement uh, whether or not it's a foundational measure and talk about that piece of it without talking about the target. We can talk about the target without being, it being a foundational measure. And we can also identify that maybe this isn't a foundational measure but a secondary measure. So those are the things that I wanted to throw out just as uh, suggestions that if somebody chooses to um, change the conversation a little bit, you can do that. If not, we're just going to go sequentially in the order that they're in. And at 6 o'clock, where we are is where we will stop. Mayor Pro Tem Malay. I think it would be helpful, at least for me, to have foundational measures defined. And I even went back to the April MBIC packet to look at that. So, because it also indicated that, that the Metro Vision draft right now has 75 things that you expect to be measuring. And so to really kind of understand the distinction of why these foundational measures are considered quote unquote foundational and could you, where, where is the definition of that term? Sure, it's, it, it's, I think it's a pretty simple way to think about this. As, as you mentioned, and it was, uh, Jacob even mentioned in his presentation, the plan right now is very performance oriented. 
There are 75 things in that plan that we're suggesting should be tracked over time to sort of see how we're doing. What separates a foundational measure from any of those other 75 is simply that it has a target. It's suggesting that this is where we, where we actually want to be in the future. And so you can think of them as, as more important, if, if you want, as sort of the, the, highla the highlights uh, of the measurement um, sort of schema that we're using. But really, what it really boils down to is that they have a target. Nothing else, no other measure has a target. We simply would just measure performance over time, share that information, and you would do with it as you see fit. Does that help? It does. Okay. It, I could ask a follow-up question. The, and, and the selection of the foundational measures was made through the public input process working with staff. And then you brought that that was your and, and when will we ever see the, all the other 75? I guess because there's I, I'm still questioning why we don't have a foundational measure related to freight and, um, and the infrastructure gap funding issue because I would think we'd want to measure how short we are on maintaining our transportation system and, and w I would think we would want to assign a target. That to me is a, so I, I don't understand why those have not raised the level of foundational measures and why this board isn't having a discussion about that. Uh, so just quickly, the foundational measures, um, to your point, largely came through stakeholder engagement efforts, um, particularly um, the Metro Vision Planning Advisory Committee had a role um, as well as TAC. Um, and ident identifying which measures should at least come to you as the foundational measures, and then also in many cases help define what the target would be. Um, in terms of elevating, um, we offered for uh, INVIC and the board to suggest uh, measures that should be elevated amongst the 75, and we received only a, only a few comments which were presented to you uh, two months ago, maybe, in terms of things that were elevated, and, and you opted not to do that, if I recall. Mayor Proto Malay. No, I, I guess I would like the board to have that discussion about are there some other things that we didn't see on the list? And I apologize that I didn't make, I guess I've been, thought I've been talking about this freight issue for a long time, but evidently I haven't. And I thought I also raised the issue of the funding gap, but clearly I didn't do it effectively. So at some point, I do think it's worth <coughs> having discussions with the full board on those issues, but I, not tonight. Are there other global comments or questions not related to a specific item? Commissioner, Commissioner Jones. Just a point of clarification. Um, the seven measures that we've already sort of, for lack of a better phrase, put to bed, we dealt with in the other meeting. Um, are we going to be formally doing anything with them tonight in terms of recommending them to the full board? Or has that been, do you perceive that as to already been done? I guess my perception is that's already done. Um, okay, just yeah. I'm sorry, I mean the the seven or so that you talked about last month that for the sort of polling sort of suggested that there was a fair amount of support. Is that correct? Is that your question? Or? Right. And the question is, do we need a motion to formally say, and Vic take, took a look at these and are recommending those to the full board favorably? Or I'll, is that perception that, that that has already been done? I'll defer to the chair, but I'll give you my, my perception is, I, is how I described it previously. I think those are ready for a decision. I, in my mind, last month, you did not take action to, to forward those to the board. So that would be something you would have to, at, this, at 6 o'clock, you will make a decision as to whether those seven would go forward or any of the remaining four as well. And I, and I think I'd prefer to address those seven first. So, well, then I would make a motion think. that we that MVIC forward with a favorable recommendation the seven foundational measures um, that we that staff just alluded to. The numbers are um, number two, six, seven, eight, nine, A, nine, B, and ten. Second. Second. I have a motion and a second. Discussion? All those in favor of the motion of moving these forward with a favorable recommendation to the full board, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. No abstentions, though. No. All right, we'll just go in order, and I'm not going to uh, read it. You can read for yourself. So foundational measure number one, uh, I'll open the discussion. Councilmember Teal. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, uh, I am going to also muddy the water, unfortunately, and group in, um, I believe it's going to be uh, grouping in um, foundation member number f foundational m measure number five with my comments on number one. And actually, uh, it came, I'd like to share a little bit that came out of the discussion I was having with my neighbor from Parker. And the problem is, is we've had staff take a look at these two foundational measures in terms of urban centers. You know, I appreciate, you know, Brad, you saying earlier that urban centers can be grown, they can be manipulated. That's going to be key in order for us to e even come close to a yes vote on this one. Because right now, there is no way, um, and I wouldn't want to speak for John, of course, but there's just no way that we come close in Castle Rock. You know, when we talk about measure number five, guys, we built a hospital. We built a real hospital. There's surgery going on and everything. It's a full-on hospital. It is five miles away from my urban center. There was no room in my urban center for an actual hospital. A clinic, you betcha. But a hospital, it just wasn't the case. So when we flash up, uh, actually, Brad, if that's okay, sure. could we get that map of the urban centers up again? Oh, yeah. Do you want, um, do you want just the urban centers or do you want the, that health facilities? Because it kind of... That's awesome. Okay. And so, you know, the bottom line is, guys, you know, I take it the or the health facilities are our triangles? Uh, the, the, so health facilities are not on here. This, this is simply the places that we're looking to, um, to calculate how many of health facilities are in uh, urban centers, which are blue. So you can see um, Castle Rock here. Um, the brown are kind of your high capacity transit corridors, including bus stops. And then the triangles are actually designated rural town centers. Okay, well, guys, you can see uh, the, the very southernmost urban center uh, above the Larkspur Triangle there. Uh, there is a hospital just a few inches to the southwest of the junction of I-25 and 85. It is miles away from our urban center. So for me to even come close to being a yes, I guess I need some variety of assurance that indeed we will be given the opportunity to grow urban centers. Uh, otherwise, guys, um, this is just a, n a non-starter. I mean, I'm, I'm asking the 60,000 people of Castle Rock to do something that is outside of their best interest. Can I respond quickly? Please. Um, I, I have often thought of these two together for a variety of reasons, often for the way that you just described it. Um, Hospitals and healthcare facilities are going to be the, if not the, a primary growth sector in this region for the next 25 years. I think we all recognize that. And so we are working from the assumption that may ultimately result in people forming urban centers around those facilities and the development that happens around it. Um, what's happening around Sky Ridge is a, is a perfect example of urban style development occurring around hospitals because they're such a natural attractor for uh, population and employment. And so that's always the expectation is that if that area becomes for Castle Rock a priority growth area and you anticipate that it's going to be uh, multimodal, have a mix of uses, potentially a variety of housing options, apply it to be an urban center. And it's really it's as simple as that. Well, in that case, I, I mean, that brings me, that starts to bring me in the sphere of at least having yes votes, especially when we talk about foundation measure one, because, yeah, that's exactly what's happening in Castle Rock. We are building commercial right outside of that. And oh, by the way, I would just remind everybody, you know, that, that hospital is well within a very short bus ride from I-25, within a very short bus ride from the junction of two railroad tracks, as well as 85 and I-25. Although I don't have bus service in, I in the Castle Rock. <laughs> Mayor Atchison. Well, I, I appreciate the comments from the uh, gentleman from Parker as well as I did the one from Castle Rock since they were speaking together I th thought that was just one voice that was going on because John didn't jump up and object but but to George's point health care facilities and the, how they're being built and how they're being located has dramatically changed we're not seeing the large number of hospitals being built what we're seeing is these 24-hour service centers that are connected to a hospital group and they're sprouting up wherever they can find a spot and they like to be close to each other because they compete just like grocery stores do but from the standpoint of 
item five, my problem is, uh, is very much like George's, they're not getting there. They're not getting in urban centers. In fact, they don't want to be in urban centers. They want to be more in the residential areas so they can draw more attention and get, draw more people. So I'm going to have a problem when we get to five, finding out how I can support this when, from an economic development standpoint, I will tell you that those I work with do not want to be in an urban <coughs> center because then they're competing with a hospital. That's where most of your bigger hospitals are going into places where we can develop a lot of commercial and other stuff around them. And hospitals bring hotels. But the move is just not there. They're too expensive to build. They're too con time consuming. And these pop-ups, 24-hour stand-up systems, if you look around the metropolitan area or around the entire state, they're growing like mushrooms. And they're all busy but they're also all associated with about one of five hospital chains. And the more they build, the more the chain gets pushed in. And it's not just in the rural areas or the urban areas. It's in, tri it's in everything. And we are trying to get those into areas that d don't necessarily have medical services today because even though they may not stand up one of these 24-hour centers fully staffed on day one, they at least look at rotational basis for specialties coming into those areas and set up schedules for them so that the people around there will start to come there instead of driving to a full-blown hospital or to a normal 24-hour emergency room. So it's a, it's a big dichotomy when you look at the at number five, as George talked about, is tying that to number one is even tough because most of us in, the, in our development will not be looking to put these small units in an urban center because they're going to dictate that they be more closely associated with residential centers than they are urban growth centers. Okay, I've got several hands up. Let me catch up. Give me a minute. All right, I've got Commissioner Roser, uh, then I've got Plas, Cernanic, Dyack, and Malay. Um, and, and let me ask a quick question. Have, have, we, have we migrated to item five? No, well, I haven't. Okay. Bob, I They're think you missed me. Combined. Sorry. Oh, I, did I? I thought you had me before. Sorry. All right. Council Member Kanich. Um, just one, uh, I really appreciated the framing in the first slide that staff um, did about the purpose of the Metro Vision Plan. And, and just to, whether we're talking about one or five, I think it's a, it's a good reminder, which is that these are about regional averages. Nothing about this plan is about each community achieving the goal individually, nor is it even about it being the goal for an individual community. So for me, just a reminder that it's about saying that it's good for the region if a lot of seniors can get to a lot of health centers in a lot of urban centers, right? It's not about every urban center in your community. It's not about every um, facility. There's good reasons, perhaps, to locate at other places. But if you think about, um, you know, we are seeing, I think, in the region, I, I forget who spoke. One of the suburban communities talked about two or three clinics coming into their new urban center. Was it Lone Tree? In our last meeting. So I do think that there are some trend lines already. And you can see the numbers. I mean, the numbers are not low. So, so to me, just again, I think this is not so much about your community going back and saying you have to do this. It's about saying, hey, it's good for the region if a lot of people can get to a lot of health centers. And so, you know, and, and the same with number one, right? It's good for the region if a lot of jobs and a lot of housing are, you know, in centers. It's, it's not about eliminating choice and it's not about saying any one community has to meet the goal independently. And so, it's all about the averages. And, and I think if we keep that regional perspective and we think about how these things performed in the scenarios, we can see the benefits to the region, right? That it, it, you know, every time we locate more jobs and housing in an, in an urban center and we save some dollars in terms of infrastructure or we save some, some VMT miles, then that actually makes it a better balance for those rural freestanding communities who are going to continue to need VMT to get to and from jobs. Or, you know, it makes more, it stretches the transportation dollar more for the, for the call on demand ride service that is maybe going to serve a community that doesn't have enough population to get a, every 10 minute service. So to me, 
it's about balancing those regional averages with the independent goals that may be slightly different for different reasons in independent communities. So I don't think you're, you know, we don't need to think about these goals as seeding individual communities, you know, decision making or even the need to have exceptions to all these things. Each of these, none of these things are, are every hospital or every job or every housing. They're all about, it's good to have a lot of these things concentrated because we know from the scenarios it creates good outcomes for all the other pieces of our goals, so. Commissioner Rocher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, real quick, if I may, Brad, a uh, question for you. When you establish an urban center, that application is brought forward to the board, is that correct? For approval? Correct. So, And oftentimes uh, through INVIC first. So. Right. So going back to uh, Councilman um, uh, Teal's comment that, uh, and, and actually going back to the last Dr. Cog board meeting, we had a we had Arapahoe County here asking to expand the urban growth boundary, and they were denied. So once again, there you could you say just put an urban growth boundary around it, but you can be denied that too, and um, thus. Councilwoman Kanish's comment of these are regional type of, of issues here. No, they're not. And let me tell you why. Yes, this sounds good. It says regional. But when you tie this to tip scoring, it becomes very, very focused and very at home. So when you say it's regional, I agree. That's what we're all here for. But when you tie in Vic to tip scoring, we all compete for those dollars. That's no longer regional because I'm competing against Denver for those same dollars. And if it's weighted this way, then it's it's Denver against Jefferson County against Arapahoe County, and that throws regionalism out the door. And so when you start looking at this, no. I don't agree. I, I respectfully disagree with the comment. Thank you. Next, I have Council Member Plus. Yeah, and I, I, we've conflated one and five a little bit. I'd just like to try to get through one first, and I appreciate that they are tied in some ways. But, but to me, I, I hope that we can, can move forward on one because I think it really is it truly a foundational measure, housing and employment located in urban centers, that compact development access to transit, all those things. And I would point out that it's very much akin to what's in the 2035, that, but we've just translated it to make it a little bit easier to do the metrics. And so it's not a huge departure. And I mean, I think that's pretty clear. And uh, I thought staff's answer to, to uh, Councilman Teal's question uh, might give a bit of reassurance to people who were concerned. Uh, and I know that was more about health centers, but there, there is a chance for, for new urban centers. I think they have to be well considered, but that certainly can happen. So, I mean, I hope that given those answers that we, we could support this, because I, I truly do think this is a, a foundational measure, um, and, and I think the targets are correct. So I, I would love to be able to, to move forward on this one. Mayor Cernanek. Uh, yes, a uh, uh, suggestion of, of sorts uh, for consideration when this moves to the next level, uh, not that I'm arguing with the, uh, with the measures of, of number one, uh, but adding to it um, a bit more of a visual of what does this look like, um, you know, projecting it out, whether it's 2040 or such. Um, and I, I don't want to argue because I'm supportive of, of the concentrations, but recognize that actually some of our urban centers may not have all of the full services that are um, important in a concentration to actually have that that exist. And so uh, uh, making sure there's an understanding of what's in an urban center, uh, reviewing a, a little bit of that definition, and for the region having a, a, a picture, a vision that says um, what, what does this mean um, and um, I know it's hypothetical because we're not putting quotas anywhere in particular and uh, very respectful of, of Robin's comments because I, I, I know that this is for the, the region in taking a look at this, but having some understanding of uh, you know, how does that ebb and flow as we're, uh, as we're looking at number one. And I'll leave my comments for number five when we get there. Councilmember Dyack. George, you want to take this or can I? <laughs> <laughs> take care of that. Great. 
All right. Um, <laughs> uh, I will. I'll just go with uh, comments on one. Um, you know, to me, uh, like George has articulated, um, you know, Denver, Denver, or I'm sorry, not Denver. Uh, Parker struggles with with this foundational measure. We're we're a part of the region. However, we we just don't know how we can participate in something like this. We have one urban center, and looking at this, we we can't achieve or even participate in this in this target. So for uh, for me, I I don't see how I can support at this point in time. Thank you. Okay, a quick recap, just so you know, I've got Malay, Teal, Stolzman, Noon, Jones, Mayor Pro Tem Malay. You know, my comments are more directed to five, so I'll wait until Thank we get you. to there. Thank you. Council Member Teal. Cool. Actually, um, uh, first, uh, I do have a question back to Brad, if that would be fine, Brad. So, Brad, I mean, we had foundational measures, but then, you know, um, uh, Mayor Potem Malay brought out the fact that there was these other measures that were not foundational measures. Can you please remind me of that phraseology there? Uh, well, we've typically used either the, the word secondary measure, just so that you can kind of see it is below that, but it really, there, we also talk about them as just overall plan performance measures, right? That, that's how you could think of them as well. We, we've used both terms with this group. Okay, thank you for that clarification because, I mean, I, I really do take into account what we heard from the council member from Denver. You know, Robin, you know, if, if it's a matter of we're trying to build something that's an average, then I would submit, guys, that, you know, foundational measure one and no, number five, they're not foundational measures. They are not these primary measures that we are going to want to move the needle on, that we are going to want to use our TIP scoring to move into place, to, to move around, very much like the honorable gentleman from Jefferson County said. So, I mean, um, from my perspective, I'd like to move that foundation measure one as appears here and foundation measure five be removed from our list of foundational measures and be included as secondary measures. Second. I have a motion and a second to remove number one and number five from foundational measures into secondary measures. Discussion, Council Member Kanich. Well, so we're, we're speaking on this motion, so I'm starting a new list for this motion, and then we'll go back. Okay. okay. Council Member Kanich. I'm fine with deferring to whoever was in the queue already. You can put me at the end of that list if the folks that were in the queue waiting want to go. Or is that not the what, chair's well, preference? I think the chair's preference is to start a new queue. Okay. Yeah, I just, I just, <laughs> I'm trying. I just. Uh, <laughs> trying. Yeah, so, I, I, um, I appreciate yeah. that, but I think that I got it. We'll get it confused. No, okay. thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I, I guess that there's another slide. Can you go one slide further, please? I just want to put in perspective. So our goal was, if you look at the goal, it's 25% of the region's housing. We're on track for 22. It's 50% of the region's employment. We're on track for 48. This is a very achievable goal. And it really has been one of the things that has put Dr. Cog on the map nationally as one of the regions that is really thinking about. So I do think that we saw in the scenario planning that driving towards these outcomes really does stretch our regional transportation dollars further. It has really good outcomes for air quality, which as you know is, is you know, something we got briefed on um, at the RTC and I think some folks have gotten briefed on in the board. but. This is, an, it, this is an achievable goal, and it is one that if we drive towards it, has good outcomes for this region. And I just really, to me, it seems like it would be a very big step backwards to say, let's not set a goal that we can achieve that we know has really good outcomes, and that actually other regions are now emulating. We would actually be going back on things that other regions have been emulating in the last five or ten years based on the work that this region has done. So I'm proud of the fact that this region's doing so well and that, um, and, and that there are good outcomes that flow from this economically as well as, you know, for the air quality issues. So, so I, 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 I would urge folks to vote against the motion. Okay, just uh, as a recap here real quick, so we have 
All, we're on the discussion of foundational versus secondary for these two items. And right now I have Holen, Jones, Stolzman, Teal, and Horn. Commissioner Holen. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I would have to uh, agree with my colleagues. Sometimes we don't agree all the time, but we agree on this one. Uh, housing is a very, very important aspect of the of our overall Metro Vision co uh, concepts. In Arapahoe County right now, we have over 8,000 uh, people who are uh, unable to find uh, affordable housing. Uh, they live, they're living in, in uh, motels along Colfax and, and, and other areas in the, in the, in the, uh, in the county. Um, I'm, I'm supportive of this measure. I think it's achievable. But we need to also focus on a f housing affordability as a, as a, as a <laughs> strong component of this, uh, of number one's foundational uh, measure. Um, we, with the um, uh, housing shortage that we're facing in, in Colorado right now, um, anybody involved in the real estate market knows how quickly a, uh, 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 houses disappear, uh, put, are put on the market and are sold very quickly. So I think this is an important measure, and I'm, I'm uh, voting against it. Commissioner Jones. So I, too, will be voting against this motion I just want to remind us that this this isn't a new foundational measure it's really been sort of the bread and butter heart and soul of prior our prior Metro vision for the region the idea of concentrating jobs and housing in a logical planned manner allows us to focus our transportation dollars in a way that stretches them provides a better bang for the buck better mobility and the seven measures that we just forwarded to the full board with a favorable recommendation are, are um, highly complemented by trying to concentrate more of our growth, more of our jobs and housing in urban centers, recognizing that we can grow and expand them and add to them. But again, logical and planned, that's how we reduce VMT. That's how we reduce single occupancy vehicle use. That's how we reduce greenhouse gas emissions. That's how we're going to help address air quality challenges and address congestion issues. Again and again, the other things that we're striving to achieve for the betterment of the region are based on this premise of trying to concentrate jobs and housing in a logical, planned fashion. So. I, I think if we start unraveling that piece of it, then we start unraveling the, the whole basis of what we've been trying to accomplish through Metro Vision in the, in the past years. So I would urge a no vote. Council Member Stoltz. Stolzman, excuse me. Thank I did you. that last time too. I everyone apologize. Everyone it's just fine. Thank you very much. I, I really uh, appreciate everyone's comments this evening so far. I, I think it's critical that this has a target and is measured over time. All we're trying to say, in my opinion, is where we would like to focus growth for employment and or housing and luckily each community can change that and bring it to the board through a process and I think that's a really positive thing and I normally um, wouldn't do this but I'm very sensitive to the amount of time that we have this evening and I think it's really important that we recommend this to the board so I'd like to move that we uh, recommend foundational measure number one to the rest of the board can't you make a substitute motion until you vote on this current motion. Oh, well, then I guess I would want to call the question. I wanted to say something. That's I, I, I want to say something. Yep. That actually so she's asked for a call for the question. For a change. I know. Wait. This is why we need the proletarian. He has to agree to it. Hold, hold, on, hold on a second. What happened? Can you withdraw that? Commission, yeah. So are you, are you offering a substitute motion? Yes. Second. To recommend foundational measure one to the board. So I have a motion and a second to recommend foundational measure number one favorably to the board at the July meeting. Can we have discussion on that? Discussion on that. Okay. Mayor Pro Tem I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> New cue. Um, 
fall out of your chair. You see, yeah, I, I actually do believe the concentration of jobs and housing um, does make a lot of sense, and I appreciate that this has been a longstanding uh, uh, Metro Vision tenant. But I am very sympathetic to the communities that don't have urban centers and that are some, and that that have been historically impacted by TIP funding that's been driven towards the urban centers. So I'm wondering if there can be language in this document that talks about the fact that this is an aspirational document with large regional goals and nothing in this document um, will be used to drive transportation improvement funding. Um, federal dollars. And that, but that doesn't mean we can't make, have a discussion in the future about doing that with certain, some of them, but it's just, this, I think what I know I struggle with at times, and I think some of my fellow board members struggle with, is this concept that anything I do today is going to impact my ability to get money down the road. And um, we come to the table with that prejudice. And I think if we are very upfront in this document about saying, this is our aspirational regional, if, if, I mean, if that's what we're saying, and that's what I've been told at this table by fellow members, that this isn't going to drive your tip dollars, that discussion is coming later, then let's put the language in the document. Let's be upfront and honest, put the language in the document, and then maybe we won't have as much heartburn. And I think that's fair to the people on the other side of this issue without the urban centers. So. Uh Council Member Teal. If the chair would please, uh, would, would be pleased or whatever the heck I'm supposed to say. <laughs> Can you explain to us how this evolution of motions will go? So we have a substitute motion to take Foundation Measure 1 to the board. So, yeah, so the, so the current motion is to favorably recommend this as a foundational measure. Once we get through the discussion, we'll have a vote on that. If it, if it is successful, it'll move forward to the board. If it's, not, if it's not successful, then we'll go back to the uh, previous motion that you made, which was to make one and five secondary motion, or secondary rather than foundational. Once that's cleared up, then we can go back to the original discussion that we were having. Awesome. So that's where we are. So then, in that case, let me uh, speak against the uh, the current motion, the substitute motion. <laughs> Listen, guys, all, all I was going for was not to dump one in five. I wasn't saying let's get rid of it. I was merely asking that we move it to a secondary measure like the other, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, 75 measures that are still measures. They're still very important. Okay? But the uh, idea is if we take... Uh, uh, you know, um, Elise's comments that if we remove one and five, we're removing these key pieces. No, we're not. These speak specifically to urban centers. These do not speak about density within the urban uh, growth boundary, the urban growth area. These speak specifically with urban centers that are unfortunately um, very small for some of us. They are restricted in nature. And so, um, again, I'd like to speak against the current motion because I'm not really sure we had a chance to vet out, uh, fully discuss the prior motion that was on the floor. But, again, th this is specifically about urban centers. Let's not muddy the waters and say everything is interconnected. You can say it's interconnected, but this is language which speaks specifically about urban centers that there are several communities in this region that are wanting for them. So I would, uh, again, urge a no vote on the current motion and returning us to the prior motion. Mayor Noon. So I don't know what I'm speaking to because I didn't, <laughs> I needed a data, um, clarification so I just might be voting no to everything because if I don't get the data I vote no so um, I guess my question is we have our trend um, our trend our target extrapolated from Metro Vision is 22 percent of the urbans of the region's housing is in urban centers but our um, but achieving the current Metro Vision target would be 22 but if you do a trend it's 12 so so we have 
12 to 25 or we have 22 to 25 and I'm having a real hard time understanding why those two numbers are so different because to me I'm voting on the number in addition to voting on the theory so if I disagree with the number I'm gonna to have to vote no if I yeah you know, so I'm just saying everybody might get a no because we're going in circles but I need to know the how the difference, what, totally explain the difference between the 12% number and the 22% number. Mr. Colfer, yes, I'll do my best, Mayor, and let me know if, I, if I've made things better or worse or about the same. Uh, so this 12% number is based on, we have a baseline of 9.3% in 2014. If you take the growth rate that occurred between 2006 and 2014, which meant we added about one percentage point to urban centers during that time period, if you run that all the way out to 2040, you end up with this 12% figure. And then this one is about if you actually, if as someone as others have mentioned, um, there's an existing Metro Vision goal related to accommodating 50% of new housing and 75% of new employment in urban centers. If we were to achieve that goal, as stated previously, we would end up with 22% of housing in urban centers and 48% of, em of employment. But, so the, really the only actual is the 12 and the 43. That's the actual. That is the observed current trend. Correct. So, so the 22 is just if we assume the same stuff we've always assumed and we assume it in the same way, we should assume we're going to get to 25. It, where 12, 9.3 is now, and it will get to 12. Yes. Okay, that's data that I live with, and 25 is too high for me. So, Mayor Horn. So, thank you. Um, my comments are the same, regardless of the motion. And they are that I think it's important for us to go back to why we developed this in the beginning and why it was a foundational member uh, uh, measure from the beginning. We developed the urban center, and, and I'm speaking as a town that does not have an urban center, <coughs> probably won't qualify for an urban center because of the transportation need. We are a rural town center, and so that's where our focus would need to be as opposed to an urban center. But that doesn't mean I'm opposed to the concept of urban centers for those locations that do have the transportation. And I think um, Commissioner Jones talked about a lot of this, but we developed this because the, the premise was that we would have transportation feeding these urban centers um, transit, not whether it's buses or or light rail or whatever it is, that would get road, uh, cars off the road, that would reduce congestion, be congestion mitigation, it would reduce air pollution, it would provide transportation to a number of people in a very concise area, a number of people who frequently couldn't otherwise afford transportation. Um, we can talk about whether low-income housing is available anywhere in the state later, but, but those were the premises. I still think they are good premises that ought to be objectives for us, and I think they are clearly primary objectives, foundational measures. If not, we're going to have trouble meeting our overall goals of congestion mitigation, um, air quality, et cetera, et cetera. And so for that reason, I think I'm in favor of the substitute measure and opposed to the original member if I'm still up to date on those. <laughs> Council Member Kanich. Commissioner Rozier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I oppose the um, substitute motion. Um, I feel, um, as uh, Councilman uh, Teal mentioned, that it is still a measure. It, it will be a secondary measure. Um, once again, it's regional. We're here about regional discussions. Uh, urban centers, for many of us, is not an urban, I mean, a regional discussion. This is, um, it, it's hard because we have areas that will never be urban centers, that will never have uh, transit, but have huge transportation needs. And if this is, once again, tied to tip scoring, um, this is a huge, um, handicap that we have uh, going into it and it it, it is very it, it's not regional in nature it's it's very specific um, it benefits some and others are left out and um, I'm gonna leave it at that thank you mayor pro tem Malay 
I'm wondering if I could ask um, Councilmember Stoltzman to amend her motion to include, um, recommend, to say recommend number one go to the board, but also include the language that I discussed earlier, earlier saying that this is our Metro vision and it should in no way should this document be seen as a roadmap for our TIP funding. And if we could include that qualifying language, I think it would alleviate a lot of the concerns. I'm just wondering if she would be, and that doesn't mean in the future we couldn't decide to include some of that. It just means that the document, we would make that as a conscious decision as a, a future board. Council Member Stolzman. Thank you. I think, I think that's a, a, obviously from all the discussions we've had at the several meetings, that's a discussion that we really need to have as a full board. Uh, because it's come up on every single foundational measure we've tried to talk to and it keeps coming back so I think on making it tied to any one is probably chunky uh, no I, I would it would apply to the whole document was what was what my comment okay. would I, be. I guess at this time I'm not comfortable just because I don't think we'll be able to get through that tonight but I think it's a discussion we absolutely need to have because there's clearly not consensus at this point on that topic can I mention that I don't like you all very much right now? <laughs> Council, <laughs> Council Member Kanich. I just I want to note that the foundation. I passed because I didn't think this piece was going to necessarily keep going, but since it has, I think it's really important. Can the staff please provide some guidance on the federal government's expectations about why we don't just distribute money as a formula and why they ask us? I mean, there is clear federal guidance on the fact that the transportation improvement program is intended for regions to give it according to a set of regional goals. That's my understanding. And so, so to, to do what is being described or proposed would be, in my understanding, counter to the entire approach the federal government has given us, which is they want us to set goals and they want us to fund in achievement of those goals. Otherwise, we would not be here. There would be a formula. We would show up once a year, and every community would get a formulaic distribution. But that's not my understanding of how the law requires us. That, that, so so I, 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 I understand. I, I don't. There's a difference between, between saying each and every one of these is specifically a pass-fail criteria on whether you get funded versus saying there should be no connection whatsoever between the plan and how we fund because I just, so, so if the staff could please just share a little bit about are we allowed to just give out tip by formula with no regional goals or are we required in fact to set goals and fund toward those goals? I think, I, I think I'm misunderstood. I think what, what I said was misunderstood. If I could uh, point of order, let me clarify what I was saying. Mayor Pro Tem Malay. Thank you, sir. Um, my, my comment was that because we include it as a foundational measure, it does not necessarily mean it's going to be one of the criteria used for TIP. It doesn't mean that it's not. I wasn't saying we shouldn't have goals. I was saying that when we come up with our TIP criteria, we will be using Metro Vision as an informative document to develop our TIP criteria, not the only document, and that not everything in it. I think we will allow the board to have the discussion and make that decision. So I was not saying we're not using this for future. I'm saying today, because we decide it's a foundational measure today, does not necessarily mean it will be one of them, for all of those. And it, it, so that was my only, I understand. I've been around the, the, okay. the board a little bit. I do understand we have criteria associated with our TIP funding and goals associated with it, so. Well, and I just, it may be helpful for others, you know, I, I, and, and I guess because when Ashley asked the question, do you mean just for this one or for the entire thing, you, your answer was for the entire document. So that's what I think, I think there was a mis- Yes. I, so I do. Uh, I th can the board, can the staff please clarify though? I mean, just to, because, because I think this is a running theme, you know, should we, should we be tying plans to funding? And I, can you just weigh in on whether so, the so feds the, give some guidance on that? The executive director is going to weigh in. That's great. Thank you. And then I'm going to defer to Steve. <laughs> but uh, yes, the federal government does expect you to tie transportation funding to something. We are, as an MPO, we are extremely fortunate that this is one of the rare places that the federal government doesn't place a lot of uh, restrictions on us. So uh, for more than two decades, uh, when uh, Dr. Cog first you know, started talking about this thing called MetroVision, we have been tying closer and closer. We've been knitting those two things together. And in fact, it's part of the reason why 
RTD, CDOT, and Dr. Cog were fighting for a period of three years over who would be the MPO once uh, the federal government created uh, those bodies. And um, because they felt like, well, as the Regional Planning Commission and already doing this growth and development planning, it made sense to do the transportation planning piece as well. So um, like several years ago, the board said, okay, let's Let's also let's let's make this a very deliberative effort where uh, we create this thing called Metro Vision, and um, uh, it, the board historically has tied uh, tip points to it. That's how they they've uh, agreed to to operate. As George pointed out at you know the uh, meeting, a couple or and I, Robin, I'm sure you weren't here because uh, Chris was here, but um, we talked about. Dr. Cog as Regional Planning Commission, as Council of Governments, as uh, MPO, and, and where that authority came from and how things were knitted together and that sort of thing. And um, <clears throat> uh, this is historically how it's been. You have to have some something to tie your transportation funding to, and this board has chosen uh, in the past to tie it to what we now call MetroVision. And with that, I'll see if... I defer to Steve if he has anything to add. Mr. Cook, any addition? Uh, yes, Steve Cook here. Um, I think one key thing is there are no, and we looked at this, remember we researched this three, four months ago, there are no specific rules in the federal law or in the draft guidance. Remember, there's no final rules yet, but there's nothing in there dictating how to do TIP project selection. So there's nothing specifically that says you must do this, 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 or this. So it is open. Uh, Jennifer just explained some of the history of how, rec recent history of how we've done it here. The federal rules <coughs> draft do note, and the law, note that we must set performance measures, but it does not, tie, it does not say how we must do uh, our TIP scoring or whatever to those performance measures. We know we will have to eventually, within a couple of years, have performance measures for safety, in terms of uh, fatalities and serious injuries. Traffic congestion, we must establish, uh, by law, we will have to establish targets for congestion. And likewise, the other one is related to asset management, which is the condition of our bridges and pavement and also uh, transit vehicles. So we will have to set measures, but the feds at this time do not have specific requirements of how the TIP has to be tied to that. It's really uh, per each MPO organization. And then the one other thing I wanted to mention that, though I don't think it's written in the law or in the language, at least historically, you know, the feds have opined that, well, you shouldn't just dole out money purely by, you know, formula by population or anything, something like that. You know, they, they have said, we don't want you doing that but they do not, do not say how prescriptive you need to be in your criteria. So Jennifer. Little history. Yeah, and I just have one more point that when FHWA has been here to do our federal certification in the past, they have actually praised Dr. Cog for taking the regional plan and tying it to um, uh, the project selection. They think that that's a, uh, a, a good way to do it. It's been called out as a, as a best practice. So I have in the queue Councilmember Teal and then Commissioner Jones, and then I'd like to see if maybe we want to vote on something. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The phrase is, if it pleases the chair. But I don't need you to say that at this time. So, um, the, but the bottom line is, guys, um, let's, let's just go back to what the questions are. The question is before us right now, moving Foundation Measure 1 to the board with a favorable recommendation. If we're that to fail, we go back to the or original measure on the floor and asking that we just take one in five, we don't eliminate it from the document, we are just moving them to secondary measures. You know, we're having, it's like uh, my wife sometimes talks about in politics you have opportunity battles and I feel like we're having opportunity rhetoric here because unfortunately, Robin, you told us just a few moments ago that it's okay, these are just, it, this isn't a big deal, these are just kind of looking for averages, it's all right, we don't have to hold each, other, each other's feet to the fire. But then you turned right around and said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, the federal government requires us to have measures. 
Guys, we voted tonight, did we not, to move seven measures with favorable recommendations to the board. So let's not muddy waters by saying, you know, where we need to go with our measures and how we have to have them. We're okay with that. I think everybody's fine with that. We have already done that work tonight. What we're looking at here is at least one measure that there is disagreement on. We do not have full consensus on. We do have people who are saying this is not tied to, this does not benefit me in any way. Furthermore, it divides our region community against community. I thought Commissioner Roger said it perfectly a few moments ago. So the bottom line is, guys, this use of urban centers as a measure is not an equitable measure. I'm not saying let's eliminate it altogether, although I'm almost thinking it should be, but I won't go there. All we're saying is let's drop it to a secondary measure. Let's fulfill our requirements as, you know, as Robin quite correctly pointed out, let's fulfill our requirements for federal, you know, uh, uh, audit, federal funding, by all means. But let's move it as a secondary, guys. It's as a foundational measure, it's building a shaky, shaky foundation because we're still talking about it when we thought it was going to get fast-tracked right through. So I would speak against the current measure. Um, I will be voting no. And guys, I encourage you to as well. I don't, I don't really think we got good consensus on this one. Commissioner Jones. I, I was going to just urge us to vote, but I guess now I'll just say a few things. I just want to remind people, if you think back, I think it must have been a year and a half ago when we started the TIP process. We started by going through the tri criteria, fine-tuning it, deciding how closely we wanted to tie it to Metro Vision, exactly what measures, how many points, and then we moved into the TIP process. That process will be followed years from now when the next TIP cycle happens. A lot of us won't be here sitting at this table when that happens. So I just suggest that um, those decisions around the TIP will happen in the TIP process. What we're doing here tonight is painting what we think the regional vision should be for the greater metropolitan area. Not what's good for a particular community, but what we all agree is in the collective good best interests of, the, uh, of our region. And with that, let's vote. I, I think Mr. Graves had his hand up. Mayor Pro Tem Malay. And, I, and I, my only comment is that I wish that what you just said could be included as a preamble to the Metro Vision document. And, and if it could, I think a lot of people would be a lot more comfortable with the measures. And I don't think saying we're going to have the discussion later on about how closely this document is going to be tied to, um, to our TIP. Uh, how close, you know, when we get ready for our TIP, because we need to evaluate the conditions that, you know, the strategic conditions at our next TIP. So, I, and I guess um, I am probably going to be voting against the motion, which I, I, have, I, have, I have a lot of consternation over. I'm, I'm not comfortable with it because I don't have an issue with this. I have an issue more with the fact that we can't have a preamble saying, look, you know, we're setting our aspirational vision for the region right now. We're going to talk about federal transportation funding in the future, and we're trying to keep those separate. Um, North Front Range does their whole land use planning document completely separate from their transportation document for that very reason. And I, and I guess I see a lot of merit in doing that. It allows a very thoughtful discussion without angst created in communities, and I don't understand why we have to create this, continue to create that angst at this table when I think there's a very reasonable solution. Okay, I have Mayor Atchison and then Councilmember Teal. In light of there's approximately 10 minutes left in this session, I am calling the question. And if we get to the other one, I'm going to call the question on that one as well. <laughs> <laughs> Point of order, I did have my hand up, Mr. Chairman, before he calls the question. Uh, or, Mr. Graves. Uh, thank you. Very quickly, I want to speak in favor of the motion by Councilman Stoltzman. You know, I, I recognize that this is a, a difficult issue, right, but I feel strongly that the region needs stretch goals, and if we don't have some things to hold our feet to the fire and make us want to do more, then I don't think that we're really being accountable as a region. So for, for that reason, I'll be voting yes to this motion.
So Mayor Atchison has called the question. I need a second. second. Motion and a second to call the question. All those in favor of stopping debate say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Abstentions? Motion to stop debate passes. So we will take a vote on the substitute motion, which is to move foundational measure number one to the full board with a favorable recommendation. I'd like a show of hands. So all those in favor of moving this forward as a foundational measure, please raise your hand. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes on a vote of 11 to 8. So the, the substitute motion has passed 11 to 8. Rec moving uh, foundational measure number one forward as a recommendation to the board. Mayor Horn, did you have a question or comment? All right, so there is no, so, so real quick, there is no need to revisit the uh, previous motion to make one and five a secondary measure. If uh, the motion maker wants to address that just to five, that can be done in, um, you know, three minutes. Um, Council Member Malay, did you have a comment? Well, I, I was hoping we, originally, way back in that first queue, I wanted to talk about number five. So I was wondering when the appropriate comment was going to be to, so let's, time to do that. Okay, let's go back to the original queue then because I do have a number of people signed up whether they remember or not. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, do you need me to re-motion to remove five from this list to the secondary then? Or can we allow number five to stand as a procedural measure? I think that what we need to do is to, since five and one were kind of lumped together and now one has been taken care of, we need to go back to the original queue of speakers that wanted to talk to five. I'm assuming they wanted to talk to five. So we'll go back to that queue and run through the names and if people want to talk to five, they can, or then we can take a motion after that. So who I had was Stolzman, Noon, Jones, and Malay. Pass. Council, Council Member Stolzman passes. Mayor Noon. I was speaking of one, but now I got to get caught up with five, so keep going. <laughs> Commissioner Jones. I too was speaking for number one. Mayor Pro Tem Malay. All right, let's see if I can read my note. Um, I'm wondering if this could, this health facilities uh, mo foundational measure could be reworded because what we really want to do is provide access to this and we're saying access is better if it's if it's in um, an urban center or a town center. I mean, I guess I'm wondering if we could word this more so it's focused on transportation issues more and I know you've added that but if the consternation is with the urban centers rural, rural centers don't we just want to provide multimodal access to these the region's health facilities? And I was just going to ask staff if there's a, a if there's another way to, to to talk about that. I mean, because for example, if if somebody provided shuttle service in their community, would that not be eligible here? Um, if it's not in an urban center or a town center or near a rapid transit station or a frequency bus stop, but a community is actually providing shuttle service, why wouldn't that still count? Mm -hmm. Jennifer. I was just telling Brad, maybe it would help if he elaborated on this a little bit, because I can read those words and I know what they say, but I was curious about what the original intent was behind this. Mr. Calvert. And, and, and it was to your, your point, it really was about access. Um, Something 
really about transportation may be very difficult because of all the varieties of ways that people would, would, be, would provide access, shuttles that we may not know anything about. Um, the measure originally in its original form started as um, health facilities and then I think it was maybe a three mile circle around each of those health facilities and how much of the region's population was within three miles of a health facility. That, that's, that's the way it started and over time it kind of ended up here. Mayor Noon. So I think given some of the discussion that we had when these were together, that I think 75% is a bit high when you consider that health facilities, as, as we're hearing, and certainly on the eastern side of, of Centennial and, and Aurora, it is exactly as, as Mayor Hutch, um, Atchison said, we are getting smaller sort of urgent care, 24-hour, and, and they are going into suburban areas to serve the need. And even the two hospitals, I mean, the Parker Hospital's not in an urban center. Not yet. I'm just saying it's, you know, I, yeah, I'm just saying that, you know, I have Centennial Medical Health Plaza. It was there way before anything was built to the east. That's been there for years. So I think 75%, I, I would be surprised if our 54% actually didn't start sliding because if you build more of those small, it, and it depends on whether you're going to say, is a health facility a, a hospital or are you going to count those urgent care, 24-hour type of, and they are calling them emergency facilities, so they're not even urgent care, they're considered a, an emergency center. They all operate off emer qualified emergency qualified, qualified emergency centers, and, and so if that could actually reduce our percentage, because you're going to have more of those, which would, and they're not going to be in urban centers, so I, I think, you know, a 65 would be aspirational, and 75%, frankly, seems almost fantasy to me, but uh, you know, I I just I'm a numbers person. Sorry, Councilmember Plus. I will move. I will move that we recommend foundational measure number five to the full board. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Yeah. I have a motion and a second to move foundational measure number five to the board with a favorable recommendation. Discussion, Councilmember Teal. Well, point of order, Mr. Chairman. I mean, doesn't. How, how does that address the original motion that we had going? So the original motion is dead because we had a substitute. Well, it, in, in that case, I mean, it's just a point of order, Mr. Chairman. That would have been nice to have articulated as we were going into this, uh, just because you talked about having people speak on the original queue, but when I specifically asked on whether a motion should be required right now, you you really did just defer right back to the queue without giving me a definitive answer. Well, I think we can we can go back and review it, but I think that when I announced that the substitute motion had passed on a vote of 11 to 8, I, I believe I stated at that point that that killed the previous motion. So I... Well, of course, defer to the chair here in terms of uh, process. It's just uh, uh, apologies. I kind of got caught a little flat-footed there. Okay. I, I, and, and if I didn't hear your question correctly, I apologize, but we do, uh, I believe, have a motion and a second on the floor. Commissioner Rozier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to make a substitute motion um, not to move forward a uh, recommendation of uh, foundation measure number five. Second. Okay, we have a substitute motion to not move this forward and a second discussion. Council Member I just would like a point of clarification if the intent of the motion is to take it out of the plan altogether or to move it to a secondary measure. Commissioner Rozier? That's correct. Which is correct. correct. <laughs> correct. <laughs> take it out. No, um, to make a secondary uh, measure. So your your secondary measure to be a secondary measure. Does the seconder agree with that? Thank you. Discussion, Mayor Cernanic. Uh, this is one that uh, there's a, a lot of things that are happening in the whole area of healthcare delivery and affordable care uh, organizations and the like. And there's uh, components where um, 
it was thought that telehealth might be a, an answer to rural health care delivery. However, it's also being one of those things that's moving forward as a convenience item uh, for folks to be able to manage their schedule so they might actually be able to have a um, video to video conference with a health care delivery professional um, in lieu and has nothing to do with where their location might be. Uh, so I would also suggest with this uh, not only that it moves to a secondary measure being in support, uh, but also that this be one of the items that is intentionally monitored closely in the context of what is happening in the healthcare delivery field. Mayor Horn. Um, so this is one that I do think can make a difference for rural communities at, as opposed to urban communities because I think it's if we go back to the original intent, it is to provide health care uh, opportunities, especially as we have an aging population, to, to a population that may not have um, other options for transportation. Nonetheless, having said that, I'm not sure that a half mile of a rapid transit station or a quarter mile of a high frequency bus stop is realistic at all in the urban areas, let alone in the rural areas. And so for that reason, I would support Commissioner Rozier's uh, substitute motion. Commissioner Monk. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, and I think along those lines, I, I, I tend to agree Idaho Springs, I mean, again, we don't have much of a dog in this fight, but as we work through obtaining a health care clinic it's sort of like wherever you want to put it let us know and, and they have a business plan that has to be met so they're gonna sort of say okay you know we need this criteria to make this thing fly so I mean I, I think is a secondary measure to me sounds I mean reasonable because I, again and I also agree with the mayor that that the game's changing and I think as we can continue to to, to provide um, the remote type of, of facilities in the broadband to accommodate that type of stuff, that further eliminates the congestion and traffic and um, provides some opportunities. So I, I'm going to support the measure as well, or the motion. Okay. Uh, at the beginning of the meeting, I said we had a hard stop at 6 o'clock. It is 6 o'clock. So if we are prepared to vote on this right now, we can do so. Otherwise, we're going to move it forward without recommendation. Question is called a second. Second. Those in favor of ending debating voting on this? Aye. Opposed? So the recommendation. <laughs> Substitute motion for. Substitute motion is to move foundational measures. Yes, by thank you. To second. secondary. Forward as a secondary measure. Correct. All right. So everybody got that. If you vote in favor of it, you are taking it off the foundational measure list and putting it on the secondary measure. So all those in favor of moving this from foundational to secondary. Aye. I'm sorry. Let me see a show of hands, please. Opposed? Show of hands. abstentions so the secondary motion carries and items number three and four will move forward to the full board without recommendation our next meeting is July 1st I believe yep. <coughs> next meeting is July 1st and at 602 we are adjourned